presentation now. Okay, uh, I'm going to talk about briefly uh, uh, on the background of this uh, industry, uh, especially on the economic perspective. Because if you understand the economic perspective, you see the motive in, uh, in blindness. And I'm going to briefly talk about uh, the difference between internal and external radiation and how the government has been justifying the safety of this plant. And, uh, yeah. So what are rare earth elements? Basically, they are these, uh, what, 17 elements? Okay, basically they are the lanthanoids, plus scandium and uh, yttrium. Okay, so like what Dr. Jayabalan has just shared just now, the problem with rare earth elements is not that they are radioactive. The problem is they are bound together with uh, radioactive elements like thorium and uranium at the bottom. So what happens is, when you refine the ore, you also refine the radioactive uh, element. So as you refine it, the waste gets to be high, uh, mildly radioactive. Like it's, not, it's not a radioactive like what you expect from a nuclear plant. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's, it's not a nuclear plant, but it is it is a massive amount of radioactive uh, an amount, big, huge amount of waste, number one, and it's low level. And uh, in terms of thorium, it is also long lasting. So, since this uh, energy forum, uh, uh, the irony is that rare earth elements are, are used in a lot of green products. Okay? Uh, in, in Prius, it's used in, as the uh, dynamo and also in the battery, the rechargeable battery. So, uh, red hot elements are also used in your LED, LCD TVs and your iPhones and all these high-tech gadgets. So, this is the dilemma. This Elements are useful for modern products, but yet the waste is so toxic. Ma magnets as well. Eh? Yeah, magnets. Uh, Neodymium magnets are ten times more powerful than uh, ferrite magnet magnets. So they are in fact used to make uh, generators for wind turbines and uh, of course the hybrid cars. Okay, uh, currently China monopolizes 97% of the global market, but they don't always have that control. So what happened was, back in the 80s, uh, China flooded the whole market with cheap red earth. And it is made, of course, it's cheap because it is made with lax environmental laws and uh, cheap labor. So what happened was, uh, because of this, China managed to, to force many of its foreign competitors into out of business. Uh, okay, they have to close shop because they cannot compete with China's uh, cheap rare earths. So, how bad are the environmental controls in China? In Baotou, which supplies about 60% of China's output, basically, their solution to the waste is to dump it in a, in a dam called a rare earth lake. So <laughs> that's how bad it is. So what happened is, this uh, over time, uh, these uh, toxic elements uh, have started to seep underground and started contaminating the underground water. So as a result, uh, nothing can grow there anymore. Uh, the, the, they cannot grow any crop there. Uh, the cancer rate soar, and then uh, they cannot even raise livestock there because the whole land there is toxic. In fact, they cannot even drink water there. They have to import water from outside because the whole area is, is uh, contaminated. So, because of this solution, uh, uh, this pollution, and also because China is realizing uh, 
they are depleting their own reserves. So China has started to, number one, impose stricter pollution controls on these mines. Number two, they tried, they started to crack down on illegal mines, the small, small refineries, uh, not licensed or not. And number three, they realized they need to protect their own industry. So they are imposing a quota on, an export quota on how much can be exported to foreign countries. So as a matter of fact, if you are to buy rare earth in China, it is cheaper than if you buy rare earth in, uh, in uh, outside China. And the reason they do that is because they want people to move their production facility to China. Okay? So they want to protect their own economy. So, okay. So this is the, this graph shows the price of uh, of this uh, Mount Well composition rare earth price uh, over this amount of uh, from 90, from 2007 to, to to 1st of October. So you can see uh, that uh, all along uh, the price has been about hovering about 10 USD per kilogram. And as China starts to cut down, uh, you see that there's a huge spike in price. Now, uh, the last price according to Mount Wells uh, composition, okay, uh, for your information, Mount Well is the, the site they will mine the ore from, and before they, the ore is shipped to Guantan for refinery. So, uh, the last price uh, of this, Mount Well Composition Rare Earth is uh, 140.64 USD per kilo. Now, even at this price, it is extremely lucrative. The reason is because uh, in, in 24th of June, JP Morgan has released a financial analysis on blindness. So according to them, the break-even price for this rare earth for Linus is at about 16.69 USD per kg per kilo. Okay, so they, they forecast Linus to make about 6.1 6 million in Aussie dollar at that price. So even at 140 USD, it is really, really fantastic profit. It's uh, almost 10 times the amount of profit you can get yeah, so this is a very, very lucrative industry for Linus. Okay, uh, some information on Linus. Uh, Linus is actually the biggest rare earth refinery in the world. Uh, it is expected to meet 30% of global supply, excluding China. Linus has been given 12 year tax exem exemption uh, for only 30 350 jobs created, and uh, the size of land is huge, okay, it's about 100 hectares, and that translates to about 140 football fields, so it's a huge area we're talking about, and only a small portion of this area is for the refinery plant itself. The remaining area of the site is actually for the storage of the waste. Okay. The land also consumes a lot of acids and uh, water. Three, the amount of three Olympic sized swimming pools per day and uh, 700 tons of uh, acids per day. And it will also generate 64,000 tons of uh, this mildly radioactive waste per year. So, according to Linus, the waste that is we are most concerned with is called WLP for water leach purification, and they claim that this waste has a radioactivity activity of uh, six point one becquerel per gram. So, thorium. This waste contains high, pretty high level of thorium. Uh, it actually has uh, 
65 parts per million of thorium oxide. And uh, thorium has a half-life of 14 billion years. So, you know, if humans become extinct, this thing is probably going to be emitting, still emitting alpha particles. For your information, 14 billion years is longer than the age of the universe. Okay. Yeah, so it's basically perpetually radioactive. So we are very concerned about that. Uh, okay, thorium. So now, alpha particles are, do not travel a long distance. Okay. Uh, alpha particles can be blocked by your skin or with just a piece of paper. But the problem is, when you ingest it, what happens when you ingest it? When you ingest it, it is next to your skin and it, the, the tissue around the source of radioactivity will be bombarded with high level of uh, this high intensity uh, alpha emission. So, okay, according to studies, right, 70% of thorium will be deposited in the bone. So, when it gets embedded in the bone, uh, only the surrounding tissue around the bone now will get bombarded with uh, this uh, high intensity radiation. So, the problem with, uh, which means that uh, actually radio, this radiation is localized. Okay, and uh, actually, this is very important because every single justification that the government put forth or the IAEA put forth uses external radiation to justify the safety of the plant. But the concern of the local residents is not so much on the external radiation, but the internal radiation when you eat it. Okay, considering that the waste will be grind to a fine dust, okay, it will be in the residue form. Uh, if it dries up, dusting can occur. And, uh, and, uh, and here are some of the comparison uh, on uh, how this waste was proposed to be handled in Australia compared to how it's being handled in Malaysia. So, Ashton is a company that Linus took over and uh, bought over the, carried over the operating license, the, operating, the license to build the entire facility in uh, Australia. So, Ashton Rare Earth has uh, submitted a proposal to build this Rare Earth facility in Australia in 1992. And, uh, when Linus bought over Ashton, they automatically acquired the license. So when you can, so by that you can do a comparison between the lamp and the Ashton and see how different it is between the treatment of the two two proposal. For the Ashton proposal in Australia, uh, only one thousand five hundred people are living within a thirty five km radius of Mount Well. Okay, and that town with these people who live in is called Everton. Uh, in comparison, we have 700 people living within a 35 km radius. Pretty high density. Uh, Ashton's waste is actually at a much lower radioactive, radioactive level than uh, Linus. Uh, almost three times lower at 2.3 pecker per second. In spite of this, their proposal is to bury the waste in underground ponds, okay, in impermeable underground ponds located away from the aquifer. Okay, and after these ponds are filled up, it's going to be covered with uh, 2.5 meters of soil and rehabilitated. So, uh, compared to the site in Lamb, it is actually situated above just above the underground water because it is on reclaimed farmland and uh, there is a report from New York Times that, uh, that says that th there are whistleblowers that approach the New York Times claiming that the 
storage ponds is of very poor construction quality and uh, there are cracks in the pond. So we are very concerned about how this thing will turn out, but it seems like uh, the land is a disaster waiting to happen. Yeah.